So good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute, Regional Milwaukee Office and Center for Community Engagement and Health Partnership, welcome to the eighth annual Minority Health Month event, Breaking the Silence, Addressing Dementia and Communities of Color, where this year's theme is systemic change through community. I'm Dr. Nia Norris and will be serving as the programs facilitator for today's presentation, New Discoveries in the Preclinical Phase of Alzheimer's Disease, Findings from the Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention. April is National Minority Health Month and in April of 2001, the National Minority Health Month Foundation launched National Minority Health Month in response to Healthy People 2010 to promote educational efforts on the health problems currently facing minorities and other health disparity populations. It is well past 2010 and our communities continue to be impacted by health disparities. And as many of you already know, dementia impacts communities of color at an alarming rate. African-Americans are estimated to be two times more likely and Latinos one and a half times more likely to be diagnosed with some form of dementia. So today we have come together to continue to break the silence about this disease to educate our entire village as we learn from our own community how we can collectively work together to help our loved ones and our community families navigate through their journeys. We hope that today is a day of learning, hope and encouragement. We know this is not the end, but just another step on our pathway. At this time, I'd also like to thank our sponsors and partners who have played a key role in ensuring that we could host this dialogue for our community. Bader Philanthropies, My Choice Wisconsin, Community Academic Aging Research Network, Direct Supply, and Milwaukee County Department of Health and Human Services, Aging and Disability Services. As we move to the presentation today, if you have any questions for the presenter, please utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will also get to as many questions as possible. And for any questions that we are unable to answer during today's presentation, we will post answers to those questions on our website. A recording will also be made available on our website as well. So now I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Sterling Johnson. Dr. Johnson is the Jean R. Finley Professor of Geriatrics and Dementia at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Dr. Johnson leads the Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention, also known as RAP, a longitudinal study of 1,700 plus people who enrolled in the project in late midlife and who have varying levels of risk for Alzheimer's disease. He is the Associate Director of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute, which is the home of RAP and also serves as Associate Director and Biomarker Leader in the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Norris. It's really great to be here. I'm excited to present today on the Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention. It's, uh, it's been a remarkable study. I continue to learn from it and be amazed by the, the study. And uh, I'm just excited to explain it to you today and give you a sense of some of the findings that we've had with the study. Um, let me share my screen while I'm doing this so I don't forget <laughs> to do that. I've been involved, I hope you can all see that now. I've been involved with this study since um, 2002, that's about the time I joined UW. The study started um, about six months before I joined UW, and um, and it's just been a thriving um, study. It was it was it began by Mark Sager, who's a geriatrician here, uh, who just had a, a visionary idea for how we could be studying people who might tell us about how Alzheimer's disease starts. And so that's really what I want to talk to you about today is. Uh, our progress that we've made on determining when this disease starts. And that in turn is gonna help us as a whole community and a whole field uh, decide and, and figure out when is the best time to treat and prevent this disease. And let me explain uh, along the way, um, but just so that we're all on the same page, I got a couple of um, introductory slides so that we're all thinking about Alzheimer's disease in the same way. 
Alzheimer's disease, you may, you may know it if you've known a, a relative with it or a loved one or a, a friend that it's a devastating cause of dementia. And um, it is the main cause, but it's not the only cause of dementia. There's other things involved too. Um, Alzheimer's is defined by two abnormal proteins that clump together. One is called amyloid and one is called tau. And the amyloid proteins clump together to form plaques and the tau proteins clump together to form tangles. And these are the plaques and tangles in Alzheimer's disease. They're abnormal proteins and they can create havoc in the brain and cause devastating cognitive and functional decline in people. But the, the thing about this disease is it has a long, very long pre-symptomatic time frame. We think it's probably 20 years on average that a person has this disease before their dementia shows up. We have imaging markers for this, and I'm gonna show you an example of that in just a second here. And we may soon have blood markers for Alzheimer's disease, and I'll show you an example of that. And it's so important that we have these blood markers because that way we can tell who among us in, in our communities may be at higher risk for this disease. And those are the people that we need to identify and get them into some sort of prevention um, program. And we can talk about where the status of the field is with regard to prevention in, in a few minutes. But it's important to realize that this disease doesn't happen all by itself. Usually um, it, it can. Alzheimer's disease is a cause of neurodegenerative disease. Um, but there are other neurodegenerative diseases that, that can cause dementia too, especially vascular disease. Stroke is still by, by far the um, biggest cause of, of death with regard to something going wrong in the brain with aging but Alzheimer's disease is behind that. Um, and and uh, together these two diseases are the largest causes of dementia. So even though I've said Alzheimer's is the main cause of dementia, um, uh, yeah, I think I, I've said a couple of things that you, let me clarify a little bit. Stroke is the biggest cause of death of something going wrong in the brain, but Alzheimer's disease is perhaps a little more common as causing dementia. But, but vascular disease is right behind it. And it's important to realize that dementia is an umbrella term. That means that a person has lost the cognitive functionality that they used to have such that they can't function in their day-to-day -day life like they used to anymore and they're impaired and they need, they need assistance doing that. That's dementia. It's a syndrome and it can have several causes. Alzheimer's is, is one of those causes. All right, let me... Um, those are some of the, the background things about Alzheimer's and dementia. You know, I often get that question, what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? And I hope you can answer that now. Dementia is the umbrella term for losing the functionality that you used to have. Alzheimer's is one of the causes and it's the most common cause. All right, well, let's drill in into Alzheimer's disease. I said it was caused by two abnormal proteins this is what these amyloid plaques look like under a microscope in somebody who's donated their brain so that we could study it. It looks like, like these little um, blotches here in the brain. And over here is what these neurofibrillary tangles look like. And, um, and you, you have to stain, um, you use different stains for each of these things so that they'll show up. But it used to be back in the olden days that we couldn't identify this disease until a person passed away. Uh, I'm showing here on the flanks of, of these um, neuropathology slides, I'm showing an amyloid scan and a tau PET scan. These are, these are both called PET scans, positron emission tomography. And with PET, uh, we can actually see these abnormal proteins. And that is pretty remarkable in and of itself that we no longer need to wait till someone passes away to learn if it's Alzheimer's disease that was the cause of their dementia. Here are two people with mild memory loss. And the person in the first column has an amyloid positive scan. That means that there's 
definite signs of amyloid present on that image. Um, and you can see that in the red here. And down on the bottom for this first person, we, we gave them a tau scan and we see evidence of the tau protein showing up in their brain as well. On the right is participant number two. They both had the same, roughly the same amount of memory loss, but this person over on the right doesn't have any signs of amyloid or tau. So that tells us something else is explaining their memory loss and we need to do more work to try to figure out what that is. The state of our field right now is that we have these kinds of clear markers for Alzheimer's disease, but we don't have clear markers for the other diseases that can affect the brain. Other than vascular disease, we can see from an MRI scan if strokes and other signs of vascular disease are present in the brain. So here's how we can put all this together. The plaques start first, and then the tangles come on board. And then these two things cause the brain cells to die. And after a certain number of cells died, um, then we start ex uh, having these cognitive symptoms to the point where we call it mild cognitive impairment. And then as that progresses, it forms dementia. This whole process from the beginnings of amyloid plaques to dementia, as I said, takes 20 years on average, but it could be anywhere from five to 30 years. And we really don't know why some people um, uh, proceed faster and why others proceed slower in their journey with this disease. And that's a big focus of our study is to try to find out why. Well, RAP has been around um, 20 years. It started in late 2001 by Mark Sager, as I mentioned. And our goals with this study are to identify uh, this disease as early as we can, and then to figure out what is about um, uh, a person or what, what kind of characteristics, health factors or genetics might speed it up or slow it down. And this is one of the only studies that is uh, looking at the midlife uh, time frame to, to study Alzheimer's disease. Well, RAP, as we call ourselves, is um, it's a big program of studies. And, and um, here's a little bit about us. It, it's led by me right now. I'm a, I'm a psychologist, neuropsychologist. And I come to this idea of studying people and looking at risk and resilience with the notion that each of us is, is different. We all have our own um, lived experience and our genetics and, and, um, and health and lifestyle. Each of us through our choices and our genetics and our environment uh, are individuals in how we um, journey through this disease, if we're gonna journey through it. And that's first and foremost what my mindset is. But our, our team has come up with these um, uh, um, mission and value statements. And I just wanted to share these with you because I think it's important that you, you know who we are as, as we're trying to study this disease and make discoveries here. First, our mission and purpose is discover and share knowledge on the early identification and prevention of Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. That's what AD and RD means, Alzheimer's and related disorders. Our vision is to empower uh, individuals from all communities to be able to prevent AD. And why us, why RAP? We have the largest cohort of risk enriched people starting at the time that is probably most value when it, of value when it comes to preventing this, and that is midlife. And we have world leading technology here at the university that is just accelerating the kind of discoveries we can do. Our core values as a, as a team of scientists and, and staff, and uh, there's over 30 people um, employed with this study our core values are scientific discoveries that are generalizable to all communities, safe and respectful engagement with people. It's a pretty vulnerable thing to come in and get your memory test tested and to have us um, take an image of your brain. And um, we appreciate the, uh, the generosity of our participants. And we wanna make sure that, that they know how valued and respected they are for the, 
for their generous contribution. Our study is really, um, we can have a high impact on the world by producing high quality research data that is easy to ex access from other qualified scientists and easy for us to share that with, with those individuals so that people with good ideas from all over the world can, can apply those to the study and make discoveries. And what we want is for the discoveries that are made to, to come back to, to the communities and to our participants. And uh, with the idea that, that we can improve brain health through the discoveries that are made from this, from this project. So our, our strategies uh, are gonna change from, from year to year, but we are really focused now on empowering discovery through access to the data in RAP. There's right now there's 18, uh, at least 18 linked studies just here at the university that, are, um, that, that piggyback on the RAP study. And we're really focused on building and supporting relationships with our participants, um, providing more feedback about their study and uh, helping them and the communities they come from to improve their own brain health. Um, I think I've said enough on our goals, um, but just to reiterate, identifying the disease before its symptoms and identify those individual factors that might speed it up or slow it down. There's a few more um, uh, facts about RAP. It's one of the world's largest and longest running studies of people at risk for AD. It was mainly centered around the idea of having a parent with dementia that was presumed due to Alzheimer's disease. And so 73% of our participants have a family history of, of dementia in their parent. The average age of our participants is about 67, 70% are women. 40% um, have a body mass index over 29. This is not unusual. This is um, Wisconsin, I guess, uh, for you. Um, most participants have been in about 11 years in the study. 40% in this age range have high blood pressure. 10% uh, are diabetic. 41% have this gene that's a risk factor gene for Alzheimer's called APOE. And um, and 50% have high cholesterol. And I just point out these numbers that most of these are very consistent with being a 67 year old. 50% of 67 year olds have high blood pressure, 40% are obese, 40% have high blood pressure. This is true of the state as a whole, and it's also true of our cohort. This is a map of where our participants live. You can see they're from all over the state, but now they've spread out to other parts of the country as well. Well, what have we, um, how have we been spending our time? What have we discovered? Um, I wanna con hopefully convince you in the next minute, in the next few minutes, how incredibly valuable this study has been in making new discoveries. And the one that I think is uh, one of our biggest discoveries of the last five years is that we can now estimate the age that Alzheimer's disease starts. And we can do this from a single PET scan. Um, We've also been making extraordinary uh, progress in identifying subtle cognitive decline well before it would be something you come to the clinic concerned about. We can identify it before that. And, um, and that's really the start of the symptomatic phase of Alzheimer's disease. We've also been making discoveries about how lifestyle and health factors might influence this disease and cognitive decline. So, um, well, here's, here's the first major point I wanna uh, show you in these graphs. Each of these little tiny dots in this top panel is a person. And each line represents that person over time when they've come back in for these <clears throat> amyloid PET scans every other year. And we've been doing this since 2009. And you can see there's a lot of people who we have these measurements on. And what we've discovered by putting all this together, this is called a spaghetti plot because of all these lines, um, but it doesn't look random like spaghetti does. It looks pretty non-random to me, such that if you're red, that means 
this, these individuals in red are amyloid positive. That means they have amyloid proteins in their brain. And what I'm seeing here and what our computer algorithms see is that their rate of change is pretty predictable. It goes up in a pretty steady rate. And that has allowed us to um, take as a given that rate of change and then apply that to an individual person. And with that, we can estimate how long they've had the disease, if they have it, and if they have it, what age were they when that disease started? And that was a pretty bold claim when we first discovered it in 2019. Uh, since then, it's been replicated by our friends in St. Louis at WashU University in the, in the adult children study, which is very similar to RAP. It's the adult children of people with dementia. The Mayo Clinic, um, in Rochester has made a very similar discovery. So all of this is coming together. There's other findings too. Um, but the idea is that once amyloid becomes elevated, it's pretty predictable. And it allows us to, to make these temporal claims about amyloid. By temporal, I mean when, when it started, how long it's lasted. Here's an example. This is a 74 year old woman who now has dementia. She's been in the study for oh, uh, well over a decade. We studied her back in when she was age 65. She had MCI back then, mild cognitive impairment. It wasn't yet dementia. She already had amyloid in her, in her brain back then based on this PET scan. And using the algorithm that we now have, now that she's age 74 and learning what we've learned from people like her, um, through this research, we've learned that um, she, she's here now, she's age 74. She's likely had this disease for, uh, for over 20 years. We estimate that she was probably age 51 when she first developed amyloid in her brain. And um, so that's an extraordinary thing. With this, we can study things like resilience to the disease in the face of having these, these proteins in your brain. We can study susceptibility, what causes susceptibility, and, uh, and, and um, other things related to that, like can a drug slow this disease down? All right, well, let's talk a little bit more about things that may slow this disease down. And, and um, this is, um, I'm lumping all these next few comments under the idea of brain health and dementia. You've probably seen in the news media or in your, in your news feed um, articles every other day about uh, if you just do this behavior or eat this food, it's going to slow down or stop dementia or prevent Alzheimer's disease. We see these all the time and it can be very confusing. And um, a study like ours, though, is really geared towards um, finding out and making more definitive claims about these kinds of things. Does hypertension prevent or slow amyloid? Does sleep uh, slow it down or speed it up? What about physical activity and stress and mood? And what about your neighborhood, your diet or inflammatory things going on? What if you did crossword puzzles or um, were socially engaged? Or what about your genetics? All of these things have been uh, claimed in the media to either cause this disease or to slow it down. And our study is one of the few that are really getting at this because we do these, we do the work. We've done the surveys, asked our participants to um, tell us about their lifestyle and health factors and what, what they're doing uh, with, with regard to physical activity and sleep and their di <clears throat> and diet, excuse me. And so, we're able to, uh, to study this over time and see how this relates. But as we think about any of these articles that are in the media, it's important to keep a couple things in mind. Um, first of all, is the study you're reading in the media, was it actually a clinical trial or was it an association study? We've got to remember that correlation does not equal causation. Correlation says that two things are associated when one goes up, the other goes up, or when one goes up, the other goes down, that's a, that's a correlation. A clinical trial, on the other hand, is you get a group of people, 
you randomize them to either being on a, a treatment, whether that be a lifestyle treatment or a drug, or and you randomize a part of them to a placebo group where they're not getting the active treatment, they're getting something that's inert or not expected to cause a drug benefit or a treatment benefit, I should say. 95% of what we read in the media about this behavior or that behavior slowing down Alzheimer's, these are correlation studies. And that's important to keep in mind. Um, take a look at the study in, in your media feed. And if it was a clinical trial, you can pay more attention to those kinds of studies. Also, how did that study define what Alzheimer's disease is? It's really important for our whole field to get a, to be more precise about what we mean about what Alzheimer's disease is. There's been too much conflating of dementia with Alzheimer's disease. And um, Alzheimer's disease needs to be defined by the presence of those amyloid plaques and, and the tangles. And if the study didn't do that, then it's likely not telling us very much about Alzheimer's disease. Okay, let me get off my soapbox and get back on to this. Um, we studied through an association study, um, several risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And we call this the Libra index, the lifestyle for brain health index. And it's things like alcohol use, cardiovascular disease, physical activity, kidney function, diabetes, cholesterol, and so forth. And you come up with a average score on these risk factors for each person for each visit. And what we find is that the people who have more couch potato-y type uh, uh, risk profiles reach cognitive decline sooner than those who have more of a healthy lifestyle. So, uh, we're finding that poor lifestyle and health is associated with cognitive decline. I want to be careful to say, um, based on my last slide, that we're not causing, we're not saying that lifestyle is causing dementia. We're just saying it's associated with a little more cognitive decline. And then we looked, to, was, were the lifestyle factors related to these protein levels based on these PET scans? And the answer was no, it's not. Um, lifestyle and health factors don't seem to be related to, to the onset age of these proteins. It's not related to how fast these proteins grow or accrue in the brain, um, but it is related to cognitive change. And so the, um, the inference or the conclusion we can make from this kind of study is that lifestyle and um, healthy behaviors, healthy physical activity, all the, and, and controlling our, our risk factors like diabetes and blood pressure and so forth, these things are gonna help us cognitively. They may not slow down the proteins of Alzheimer's disease, but they may give us a little bit of a buffer or a little bit of protection for a little bit longer against Alzheimer's disease if in fact that disease is part of our future. So I don't know how much of a buffer it's gonna provide. Is it one year? Is it three years? Is it 10 years? That's a big focus of our study and we have lots of work to do on that front. Well, let me segue from there into um, a uh, just a, a little bit more commentary on how can we go, go ahead and, and take control of our own brain health? And I wanna share five ways you can do that. And then I'll get back to showing you some more data. Um, one is to see your doctor and talk about these big things right here, blood pressure, um, cholesterol, minimizing the effect of diabetes or, or risk for diabetes. Through, through diet and, and, and activity usually, um, stopping smoking and treating any mental health related uh, issues that may be going on. These things are so important, not just for our brain health, but for our bodily health, for our heart and um, for our vessels and other organs in our body, but they are really important for brain health. And so 
I think that would be my number one recommendation for promoting brain health is to get to the doctor and have these things checked and then have a conversation about that. From a day-to-day -day perspective, I've got these recommendations over here, daily lifestyle, exercising regularly. That could be anything from um, taking a long walk to, uh, to going to the gym. It doesn't have to cost money. Uh, we can exercise in our own homes or, or apartments as the case may be. And really walking is an extraordinarily good way of getting the activity that we need. Making sleep a priority is important for all of us. It's something I have to remind myself over and over again. Um, a healthy diet is um, good for the brain. And you can think of your diet as if it's, if it's good for your heart, it's gonna be good for your brain too. We wanna avoid factory foods and uh, you know, all, all those kinds of high, uh, high fructose corn syrup or high sugar content foods, read the labels, try to find foods that are, um, that are healthier and, uh, you know, eating lots more veggies than what we're doing now is probably a, a good thing to, to think about. Um, also challenging your brain cognitively with activities you enjoy is so important and, um, whether that be uh, hobbies you like to do or learning a new language or uh, picking up an instrument, it doesn't, what you do doesn't matter as much as take time to concentrate. Uh, even meditation is a really good way and being mindful is a good way of, of engaging your brain. All of these things promote blood flow, brain cell growth and um, the complexity of those cells and the number of synapses they have, which is the connections from one cell to another, and the hormone balance in our brain of things like insulin and other hormones that live in our brains. Okay, well, let me um, talk next about um, what is next for our study and what is next for our field and how can we be a part of it. And um, there's, really, um, I, I can't think of a more exciting time for our field than where we're at right now. We have drugs that are um, in the pipeline. One of them was approved this last year. Medicare is not ready to pay for it yet, but the drug was approved and that was a major breakthrough. And there was a lot of painful lessons with that drug being approved. It's called aducanumab, by the way, and it, it lowers amyloid back to normal levels. It removes amyloid plaques from the brain. And that is actually pretty remarkable. I don't think as a field, we know quite yet when the best time to give a drug like that would be. My opinion is that it ought to be done before we get too much other, go other things going on, uh, before severe cognitive symptoms, maybe just right at the beginning of cognitive symptoms, maybe before uh, uh, before tau proteins build up in the brain would be the best time to treat amyloid, since amyloid seems to happen somewhere between two and 10 years before, or between two and 20 years before uh, the tau proteins start to build up. So we have at least five drugs in the pipeline that are being investigated throughout the world. And these uh, prevention trials and clinical trials about amyloid lowering therapies is going to be um, a game changer for our field. And uh, like I said, we've just got one approved now, but there'll be many more in the pipeline. And, and through all of these things, we'll be discovering when is the best time to treat before or after symptoms and before or after tau and so forth. Well, another big deal that's going to help us with clinical trials and with studies like ours, where we're just looking at what's associated with faster Alzheimer's disease or slower Alzheimer's disease is, is blood tests for this disease. Right now, we either have to ask you as if you're a research volunteer to have one of these PET scans, which involves a little bit of low dose radiation, uh, or to do a, a lumbar puncture where we get spinal fluid because that contains the proteins involved with Alzheimer's disease. These things are not 
always things participants are comfortable doing and for, for understandable reasons. But um, looking in the blood is usually, we're all familiar with giving a little blood for um, either for humanitarian reasons to give blood or uh, for our own medical checkups, we give, um, we, we, uh, you know, we have a blood draw at the lab and get our cholesterol checked. I think it won't be too much longer before we can have a blood lab where we have our Alzheimer's proteins checked for whether they are abnormal or not. And I'm gonna show you a couple of slides on that. But before I, wanted, before I do, I just wanna let you know there's a lot of unanswered questions about these blood tests. And we as a study are in the middle of this and we would like to have answers to these questions. We're gonna need help doing it and hopefully help from, from people uh, maybe from some of you who are attending today, who if you're part of the study, we need blood from you and as well as maybe doing these PET scans so that we can look at the agreement between blood and a PET scan. But regardless, um, our whole field needs volunteers who are willing to do these kind of experimental tests to help us understand when this disease starts and um, how should we interpret these various tests. So here's, here's some of these unanswered questions. How much amyloid in tau in the blood is abnormal? What, what's the threshold for being normal and abnormal? And would this blood test give us the same information as we would get from a gold standard um, medical test, like one of these amyloid or tau PET scans? And just what do we mean by abnormal in the first place? What is that threshold? And does it apply to me and in, in my community? And, what is the impact of, of other um, things in the body that might influence these protein levels? For example, what about liver function or kidney function? Um, do these things affect protein levels and is that gonna influence how these things are interpreted? These are just, all, there's all kinds of questions that need to be answered, but so far the proof of concept studies are just overwhelmingly good and and hopeful and, um, and so we're excited about them. Do these tests predict cognitive decline? And are the tests generalizable to all communities? These are things we need to know. So um, we are actively doing these kinds of uh, blood tests ourselves. And if you would like to get involved with these things, um, please visit our website and, and um, uh, contact us and we'd love to, to talk to you about it. Here's an example of how these blood tests work. And um, well, how do you know if a new test is as good as your gold standard? You gotta have people who do both, the, the blood test and the gold standard PET scan. And we have that in, in this study here, we, we had 170 people who had blood tests and they also did these PET scans. And what we found was that the blood test had really high agreement with the gold standard PET scans. Um, one would be a perfect agreement. The, the agreement here was 0 0.92, 0 0.92. That's pretty close to one. And then with the other PET scan, the tau PET scan, the agreement was 0 0.96. Again, very close to near perfect agreement. And in fact, for tau, if your blood test was low enough uh, it had it had perfect agreement for saying you don't have the pathology. If the blood test is high, um, there's still some false positives here, but by and large, it's it's pretty accurate. And it, is it ready for the clinic? No, there's still lots of questions to answer, like I mentioned on the last slide. But is it promising? It, yes, it's really really promising. So in these slides. These dots here are from people who, who are positive on their gold standard PET scan for amyloid and over here for tau. And in, in these um, more compressed um, uh, clusters here, these are people who are negative for their amyloid in their brain. And that means they don't have amyloid in their brain. And similarly for tau, these people don't have tau in their brain. So really good. Um, the other thing is, do these blood tests predict decline? And the answer to that is yes. These blood, blood tests were drawn on average from our participants when they were age 63. That was the average age. 
And people who had high levels in their blood declined faster over the next um, 15 to 20 years than people who had a low level in their blood. And that's shown in this plot in the lower left. Cognition is, is over here on the y-axis, age is over here. And so this orange curve are the people who start um, cognitively in the normal range above zero, above average, and then they just start declining and it seems to be faster than normal aging. Well, you might be asking, does this work in people like me and in, in my community? And today we're focused on African Americans and we really wanna make sure these blood tests uh, are just as interpretable um, in, in the community that you come from, regardless of what community that is. And so we've looked at 179 African American participants from our program, from RAMP, and also from our uh, sister study, the Alzheimer's Research Center. And these people were all cognitively normal. And um, we, this is another protein in the blood. It's the actual amyloid protein itself. We asked the question, does this predict cognitive change? And this was in a bunch of people whose average age was 66. And the answer, does do these things predict cognitive change was yes. People who had abnormal levels in their blood took longer to complete one of our timed um, cognitive tests that we ask our participants to do. And also on a memory test, uh, the people with with abnormal levels in their blood exhibited greater change over time as they aged on our main memory test in the study. Um, and, it, and, and these things were statistically significant and more importantly, they, they're, they look like they're clinically meaningful changes that are taking place over time. So this is really extraordinary. I wanted to share that with you. We, we have not yet published this result, but we think it's important enough that you need to know about it. And we are, are looking forward to publishing this this summer and, um, and uh, adding this to, to the literature as, as our scientific field really grapples with these, with these blood markers and bring them into our folds of, of tools and also into clinical, um, in, into the clinical uh, scenario with with uh, using these, uh, maybe being ordered by a doctor eventually, and using it to guide an individual on um, what lifestyle and brain health changes they need to make, or whether they need to go on a drug for Alzheimer's or something else. So um, I wanted to uh, leave you with with just a couple of other things that have happened with our study. Uh, some of you may know that, that uh, the RAP program of studies was featured on NOVA um, on April 6th, just uh, two or three weeks ago. And that documentary is still on the NOVA website and you can get to it here if you want at pbs.org. If you type in Determined, which is the name of the documentary, uh, you will come to, to this website and you can stream this right from NOVA, uh, right from PBS. This is about three of our participants in the study. It's not necessarily about the findings and everything, but it's more about the participants. And that's really, I'm so happy about this, about the, um, the focus and about showing um, the research participants are just like everyone else with their own um, struggles and worries in life that they're dealing with in addition to, um, to thinking about Alzheimer's disease. Well, these three women, um, uh, it, it shows them and their, uh, um, their own journey. And each of them had a parent with Alzheimer's disease and it describes uh, that whole process. And I think it does a really wonderful job of honoring the, the whole idea of being a research participant, because it is really a generous thing to do, uh, to donate a person's time and to trust us enough to, 
to make measurements about what's going on in your brain and to trust us enough that, that we'll let you know and, and keep you a part of that process as we go along. Um, anyway, it's a great documentary. <laughs> I'm a little biased, but I think it's really, um, I, I think it's an important um, addition to, uh, to the conversation about Alzheimer's disease and would urge you to, to look at that. Also, if you or anyone you know um, is struggling with memory impairment, if you have a loved one who you're worried about, uh, you can look at our website at the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute to see if there is a memory specialist in your, um, in your county, um, wai.wis.edu. We have these stars here are, are where we have our clinics all over the state, including several in south central Wisconsin and eastern southern Wisconsin in the Milwaukee and, and um, Waukesha area. So uh, these, these are um, clinics that are part of our institute and these, the clinic doctors get together with us every six months and learn the latest about Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. They're really good uh, clinicians and experts in this disease. And um, that can be a resource for you. Also think about our own podcast called Dementia Matters. And it's hosted by Dr. Nate Chin. Um, and uh, dementia is a, is a disease of the gray matter, which is the play on words here. The gray matter is um, uh, the, the cortex of the brain where the plaques and tangles form. And there's three ways to listen to this podcast. Um, first of all, it's on the radio. And if you're in the Dane County area, you can get to it at our website here or you can get to it through Spotify or your, your own um, uh, podcast app on your smartphone. So it, I'd urge you to look at that. There's more in-depth discussions about um, research findings. There's people explaining the importance of their research to the community. And um, anyway, it's, it's a good resource. I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to talk about today. I, I uh, want to make sure we have time for your questions. So let me stop there and thank you for listening and um, open it up for any questions or comments. Yes, thank you, Dr. Johnson. We do have quite a few questions uh, for you. And um, I can start by, first of all, just saying it sounds like there is you know, remarkable and extraordinary progress um, with the discoveries right now through research and imaging, um, and that we're really continuing to learn a lot through research par participation. So that's very promising. Um, but I am going to get to some questions that we have here in the chat. And the first one, um, an individual asks, I'm almost 60 years old and Alzheimer's disease is prominent in my family. Mother is diagnosed at age 77. Um, if current findings indicate possible memory decline 20 years prior to visible symptoms showing, shouldn't I have a PET scan performed? It's a great question. Right now, most of the time, these PET scans are done in research. So if you're, if you're a part of the study, we can do these PET scans with the research study and, um, and for people who have memory impairment right now, we let them know the results of their PET scan. And we're working on a process to let um, even our unimpaired participants know about their result. And I can't guarantee I can, I can do that yet because we still need to get it, that process approved. But we've opened that dialogue with our, what we call our institutional review board that uh, governs how we disclose results. We think it'll go okay, but I, I just want you to know that it's not necessarily easy to get these PET scans yet, unless you're part of a research study. Um, but we can do it as far as part of the study, and we just got new funding for one of the RapLink studies to do that. As far as if you are concerned about your memory, um, you can go to your to your doctor or to one of those clinics that I showed on the prior. Uh, slide and, and get it checked out that way. But I think the time is coming where, where our field will be able to have a screener like this. And the kind of question that was asked, 
can be answered with one of these blood tests. We're not quite there yet. We still have a little bit of work to go and Medicare is not willing to pay for these PET scans for everybody yet. They will pay for them um, under certain limited conditions. And, um, uh, but it, it's, I think our study is, I kind of think of us as being five years ahead of where the field is. And I think five years from now, these things that we're talking about in research right now will be common in the, in the community. Okay. Wonderful. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for that one. <laughs> we do have another uh, question. This individual asks, please explain how the differential CMP, BMP, and UTI, as well as other diseases lead to dementia and how to handle that. Um, I think by that we mean um, CMP, is that complete metabolic panel? Is that like the blood tests and I believe so. I think that's what this individual is referring to. Yeah, infections and other things like that. Um, well, the what it does is it um, the, these blood tests interfere with the Alzheimer's blood test, or at least that's a possibility. And we just need to check that out. Uh, there hasn't been enough research done on that to know how it impacts the accuracy of that Alzheimer's biomarker that we can get out of the blood that I was telling you about. But it does bring up other questions, and that is, um, if I have an infection, is it going to impact my risk for dementia? And um, I think the answer is largely no. It it probably won't. Uh, it, at least not Alzheimer's disease. Do, do chronic infections um, raise your risk for other causes of of brain decline? possibly. And so we want to make sure that any chronic infections are treated uh, appropriately and brought to medical attention and so forth um, so that they don't create more havoc um, on the body. But in general, there's not a strong relationship between infections and dementia. But in, in the complete metabolic panel um, and other lab tests like uh, um, your, your test for cholesterol or your blood pressure, we know that those things are risk factors for vascular disease and that can affect your heart as well as your brain. So it's important to keep up on all of those things um, because even though they may not be related to Alzheimer's, they may be related to brain health in other ways. And this individual asks, is there any chance in reversing plaque buildup? So if you started in the study in your 50s and by your 60s, you changed your diet, exercise, lost weight, lowered your blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera uh, would there be any possible decrease? I think that um, there's a two-part answer to that. The first part is, will it slow down the plaques? I think the answer is no, it won't. But will it slow down the cognitive symptoms? I think the answer to that is yes. And that's because eating right, exercising, all these things give us a general brain buffer. They help us produce more synapses and just keep our neurons, our nerve cells happier in the brain by keeping them perfused with blood and, and uh, making sure that they have enough flow around them to get the nutrients our brain cells need. But it does it slow down amyloid plaques or does it reverse it? No, it doesn't. And I think that's where the, the media has some catching up to do with the science. And, uh, and it's important for the science to actually get caught up with this as well. And we have to, to get our findings out there into the world so that, um, uh, so that it can be, um, digested by the media and by all of us uh, in a way that's, that's, that's accurate. But I don't think a, a certain diet change or exercise will slow down amyloid plaques. Okay. Um, so you did mention that there may soon be, um, you know, blood biomarkers for Alzheimer's. And this individual would like to know what is the rough time frame we're looking at in terms of them being available to be used clinically for diagnosis or prognosis? I think it's going to be within the next two to three years. 
we already have one test that's clinically approved. It's called um, the Percivity test, and it's it's a company called C2N, and um, physicians can order that. It's just too soon for insurance panels to be paying for it. I think the time will come where all that happens, but there's several hoops to jump through there. One is getting it approved to be used clinically. And then there's, will Medicare pay for it? Will insurance panels pay for it? Um, and, and you know all those uh, questions, but the technology is being developed at an extraordinarily rapid pace. And I think they will be available clinically within the next few years. Wow, wonderful. Um, how about percentage wise in terms of participation? What percentage of your current participants are of minority groups? It's a great question. In the RAP study, it's 16%. And um, that's not high enough. I want it to be higher than that. Um, that's where we're at. So 16% of 1,700 people is where we're at. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's right around 270, 280 people, I think, in the study. Um, we'd like that to be over 20%, over 25% if we can. And um, we'd love your help in um, spreading the word. If, if somebody has the time and, and um, willingness to be in a research study, we would love to have them in it. Wonderful. Um, we do have a few more questions that we're gonna get to. I'm gonna hop over to the chat side. I see some there. Um, this individual is asking, what stage is someone entering where they still hold conversations, but vocabulary is starting to slip? Um, sundowning is in, in effect at night. So how long before it begins um, in those stages? Yeah, I think that's right there from those symptoms. I think that's... Um enough symptoms that I would be concerned and take, uh, take your loved one in to the doctor and explain those symptoms. And um, uh, maybe there'll be a treatable uh, condition that can be identified, or if it is in fact, Alzheimer's or another cause of dementia, that can at least be on your doctor's radar and they can start to address that. Those, those do sound like symptoms that would be worthwhile to get checked out. Now, you did mention um, in your presentation, you know, five ways of promoting brain health, um, and it was mentioned the Mediterranean diet was specifically listed. Um, are you able to share a little bit more about why this particular diet is referenced? It's referenced because it's got the most research done on it. Um, people who hold uh, to a Mediterranean diet seem to um, have better cognition. Now, whether that's this correlational idea or whether it truly is a causative thing from the diet, we don't know. But there is enough research um, with regard to vessel health and overall brain and heart health that Mediterranean diet is a good one. It's by no means the only good one. And I think that the key ingredient to all of the effective diets for brain health is upping our vegetable uh, proportion, especially green leafy vegetables, and lowering our sugar component. Okay, so I'm going to give you about two more questions here. And if we don't get to everyone's today, once again, as I mentioned, we will get to those and have those um, posted for you on our website. We do want to make sure we get to everyone's questions in some form or manner. Um, so this next question is, has there been any findings or studies underway that determine the effect of long COVID and Alzheimer's disease? That's a great question. Those studies are happening, yes. Um, there's several across the country that are looking at the effect of long COVID and, and um, risk for dementia. Does it cause Alzheimer's proteins or does it cause some other form of dementia? Or just is it just that general feeling of brain cloudiness that, that comes with long COVID? We don't know the answer, um, but it is actively being studied. Okay. And lastly, Dr. Johnson, how can I join the RAP study? Well, the, uh, the easiest way is to go to our website, rap.wisc.edu, and um, go to the, the tab there on participating, and that'll tell you how to get more involved. It'll give you a phone number you can call, and uh, we'd love to talk to you more about it. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you once again, Dr. Johnson, for being our presenter for the day, for being a part of this Breaking the Silence um, program again for this year. And thank you all of us for joining. Um, thank you to all of you for joining. And upon conclusion of this presentation, we ask that you please take time to complete our survey and our evaluation. This is really going to help inform us on how we are serving the community and the things that you'd love to learn more. Um, evaluation should either pop up in a new window after you close this Zoom webinar or it will be emailed to you directly. And so on behalf of our organization, the WAI Regional Milwaukee office, we hope that you enjoyed today's session and we look forward to you joining us again for our final presentation and panel discussion on Thursday, April 28th at 10 a.m. So thank you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you.